The book of Exodus. We are going to be in Exodus chapter 8 as we continue in our study of this book, studying chapters 8 through 10 this evening. And as you are turning there and getting your notepads ready, if you are taking notes tonight, the title of this message is very creatively very creatively titled, The Plagues of Egypt, because that's all I could come up with, and the plagues of Egypt. That's what we're studying in these chapters, and so that's what the title of the study is. And if you've been with us, just to remind ourselves, and if you haven't been with us, to educate yourself and to, to let you know some background and the way that we're attacking this book, how we've broken it down. We know that Moses, well, he is the one who wrote the book of Exodus. He wrote the first five books of the Bible, in fact, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Me. And we studied Genesis last year, we started Exodus last year, and this year we're going to endeavor to study the, the rest of the first five books of the Bible. So we will seek to do that, and if the Lord wants us to do it, we'll do it. If we don't get through it, hey, it's, it's okay. He'll, he'll, he'll provide for us. And uh, we've broken this book down into two sections that really bring out the themes of this book as well, where we see first in chapters 1 through 18, the deliverance of God's people. The deliverance of God's people, exactly what we're studying. There is Moses has gone to Egypt and is going to be the one who delivers God's people. Well, that is what we see in chapters 1 through 18. But after that comes the people of God being identified as God's people. And we see that in chapters 19 through 40, all the way to the end of the book. And we've discussed thus far, and we'll continue to remind ourselves that this is not only a theme for the book of Exodus, but it's also a theme for the, for the Christian life. Whereas we are born to this world sinners, enslaved to sin, it is Jesus Christ and his finished work that delivers us from the bondage of sin as we accept the finished work of, sal of Jesus Christ unto salvation. But then starts a, a lifelong journey of identifying ourselves as belonging to him, this life of sanctification, of learning what it is to be a child of God and to live for him as one of his, well, that is something that we see paralleled with the book of Exodus. And we'll continue to remind ourselves of that as we study. And as we come to chapter 8 tonight, we, we come to the section many of us are familiar with when it comes to the book of Exodus. That is, of course, the plagues of Egypt. Whereas God has called Moses again to go to Egypt to be the deliverer of God's people, well, God told Moses openly and honestly up front that that was going to be a difficult task. It was going to be difficult because Pharaoh was not going to just let his people go, but rather he was going to harden his heart and put his, you know, uh, you know, draw the line with the Lord, if you will, and not let the people go quietly. And so we know that God told Moses that as Pharaoh would harden his heart, well, so would God send his signs and his wonders, plagues onto the nation of Egypt that would, uh, you know, break Pharaoh of his grip on his people. He would refuse, his heart would be hardened, and God would use mighty signs and wonders so as to deliver his people from bondage. And we mentioned last week, but we should clarify again as we get into this study, that these plagues, the signs and the wonders of the Lord, they really serve two purposes. We see first again, as I just said, that they show Pharaoh who the one true God is. That in fact, it is the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, who is asking or demanding of Pharaoh to let his people go. Uh, this, show, this showing of these signs and wonders are for Pharaoh, that he would know who is in charge and that it's not him. And so we're going to see that that is one of the reasons. But secondly, these plagues also serve as an encouragement for God's people. Uh, again, we mentioned last week that at this point in the generational line of the Hebrews, uh, there would only be those who have been born in Egypt that would belong to the people of God. There would be no one who came from, you know, the original house of Israel. They would all be born, have been born in Egypt and so would have been brought up in this culture, and it really just inundated with a culture of, 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 of polytheism. And so what we see here is God's signs and wonders were not only a showing to Pharaoh of who is in charge, but also a showing to God's people of who is in charge. That they knew that as they walked with the Lord out of Egypt, that they could trust him, that they knew he was strong, that he was in charge, that he was the Lord's. And tonight we are going to walk through eight of the 10 plagues 
in the chapters before us. We, if you'll remember, covered the first plague last week as we saw there the Nile River turning to blood. And we're going to leave the last plague, what is the death of the firstborn, uh, for next week. And the reason for that is it's really a plague all to itself. It's an event all to itself as you have not only the plague and the death of the firstborn there in Egypt, but you also have the Passover that is instituted there. And so diving into that, we, we don't have the time tonight to really do that justice and get into it. So we are going to discuss the middle eight plagues, if you will, as we study tonight. And as we study these, we're going to be uh, attacking them, if you will, in the same way we did last week. Whereas we look at the plagues, we're going to see what pagan uh, Egyptian deity that plague comes against, and then the reaction of Pharaoh makes some comments about it, and then we will also uh, seek to draw some application because there is much to find within God's Word. And we start this out tonight, there in chapter 8, verses 1 through 15, with this first plague. And so if you have your Bibles, read with me there, if you will. In verse 1 it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go to Pharaoh, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all of your territory with frogs. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house and into your bedroom, on your bed, into the houses of your servants, on your people, into your ovens, and into your kneading bowls. And the frogs shall come up on you, on your people, and on all your servants. And then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt." So Aaron, he stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs, they came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians, they did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, Accept the honor of saying, When, when I shall in, intercede for you, for your servants and for your people, to destroy the frogs from your houses, that they may remain in the river only. So he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Let it be according to your word, that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from you, from your houses, from your servants, and from your people, that shall remain in the river only. And then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh. And Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. So the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courtyards, and out of the fields. They gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. Let's pray real fast before we continue on. Lord, we thank you so much for this night. So much, God, for what are the opportunity the opportunity and the freedom, the invitation from you that we have to run boldly into your presence, to run boldly into, Lord, your throne room and just enjoy time with you and time in your word, God. And I just thank you so much for these that come out on Wednesday nights and the ones I know who tune in online. God, I just thank you so much. And I praise you because, Lord, we are here together to learn from your word and to learn, Lord, what it says and how to apply it to our lives. And I pray that tonight, God, as I always do, that you would help us with that. Because, Lord, we desire to learn. We desire to know what you want us to know, that we may live our lives according to how you want us to live. And so, God, be, be with us in this time. Help us, Lord. And I ask it expectantly because, God, you desire to lead us. You desire to help us, and you want to lead our lives. So lead us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, as we go through this, if you are taking notes tonight, the way that we will look at all of these plagues is, again, we will discuss the plague itself. Really, as we read the word tonight, the word, I'm so, I love it. Again, this is such a, a showing of how we can just read and study the Bible simply, because as we read tonight, you, you get the message of the word, like what happens, how it happens. I love the simplicity of God's word. But as we study, and if you're taking notes, the way that we will look at this is we will read and discuss the plague itself. We will also, again, discuss what deity or religious system that this plague affronts or confronts there in Egypt. And then again, we will seek to draw some application from the responses, mainly of Pharaoh, but also to of Moses towards Pharaoh as well. And again, this is some good stuff that we see. And the first plague that we see, as we just read, is a plague of frogs. 
It's frogs. As we just read, the, the, the plague involves frogs coming up over the entire land of Egypt. As God there, he, he goes and commands Moses, and Moses relays to Aaron to stretch out his rod over the Nile River. And as he does, it says that frogs, they came up and they covered the entire land of Egypt. And now we notice, and I do want to make sure that we notice this, we mentioned it last week, that the magicians of Pharaoh, the priests, the magicians, the sorcerers, that they were able to replicate this plague in the same way they were able to replicate the miracle of the rod turning to the serpent, as well as the Nile, the water turning to blood. And I want to make mention that as the Bible says that they replicated that, that both the language of the text is very clear that it was a real, you know, manifesting of the frogs and the blood. And the, and the snakes. It wasn't some sleight of hand trick. The language makes it very clear. As well, what we're seeing here is that as Pharaoh is resisting the word of the Lord and resisting the work of the Lord, well, he's backed by who is against the Lord always, and that is Satan. There is satanic influence. I fully believe, because that's what we see throughout all the word of God, that is allowing these sorcerers, these magicians to replicate these miracles. However, as I say that, I do want to make mention that this is the last time that they're going to be able to do that. It was the serpents and then the Nile and now the frogs. But after that, these guys, they're out of their depth. They're just not going to be able to hang with the power of God. And so I want to make mention of that, that we notice it, but I also want to make mention that this is it for them. And we will see them respond in that way as they realize that they're no match for the Lord's. But as you're taking notes, what we look at tonight is, again, the false deity and some comments about this. And the false deity that's being attacked here by this plague is the Egyptian god of Hecate. And she is the goddess of fertility and childbirth. And there are going to be slides that are going to be showing up on the screen throughout this evening that show what these deities look like. So those are burned into your brain forever. And I hope you enjoy that. Go home and enjoy that. And Hecate is the goddess of fertility or of childbirth. And we need to understand that as the Egyptians saw the frogs and would see frogs just in in normal daily life, they actually enjoyed them. In fact, they worshiped the frog. They loved it as the symbol of fertility. They also enjoyed that the frogs were natural, uh, you know, pesticides. In fact, within the nation of Egypt, it was illegal to kill a frog. It was illegal for people to kill a frog should it jump into your food or, or, or be a nuisance to you. It was against the law for an Egyptian to kill this frog. And so you can imagine as you are just inundated, just plagued literally by so many, an abundance of frogs in every crook and cranny of your house, you can't do anything about it because that would be against the law. And it was just over an overabundance of this. And as the plague comes upon Egypt, we see that Pharaoh, he calls Moses and Aaron and asks them to entreat the Lord. He's like, this is too much. We like frogs, but this is this too many frogs, too many frogs they need to go. And so he calls upon Moses and Aaron to entreat the Lord for the removal of the frogs. And as he does so, he promises. He promises that he will release the Hebrews. But as Moses prays, the frogs go back into the Nile or they die and they're no longer allowed to come back out of the Nile as they normally would. Pharaoh, we see, hardens his heart and he doesn't release God's people. And again, that's kind of the flow of how we will look at all of these plagues tonight as we study. But I want to make mention, we need to notice that as we see Moses and Pharaoh and they have this interaction, they're going to have continual interactions between these plagues, the plague coming upon Egypt and then Moses and Pharaoh having an interchange on how to get rid of it. We need to notice tonight, and I want you to to notice that Pharaoh, as he says that he wants them gone, as he says that he wants them gone, Moses asks, and it's inferred in the text that Moses could get rid of them immediately, He asks Pharaoh, hey, when would you like these to go? And notice what Pharaoh says. He says, tomorrow. He says, tomorrow. Again, it seems odd, especially when you think of the magnitude of this thing. Again, they liked frogs and all, but they certainly didn't like this. But yet when Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, hey, when would you like for me to 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 get these out of here? In fact, Moses says, I'll let you decide when. Pharaoh says, tomorrow. And I point that out, and while it may seem odd to read, it's really not too far off, quite honestly, from how we can be with our own lives and our own sin and filth and the plague of sin in our own lives that, quite honestly, we allow in. We're like Pharaoh speaking to Moses again. He, he had a way for the frogs to go away, and as they conversed with one another, he gave him the option of when they would go. Pharaoh, though Moses obviously could say, okay, well, they can be gone as soon as you say, No, he said, how about we let it go 
tomorrow. Yet he chose to let them stay a little while longer. And like Pharaoh spoke to Moses, and like that conversation goes, so too does Jesus in our own lives offer to us, you know, as we are saved, freedom from sin. Does he offer to us help to break the stronghold, to remove sin from our life and to walk in freedom from sin? That's the beautiful thing about salvation is that Jesus didn't just die to save us from eternity in hell, but also to live a new life here on earth. But yet so many times the Lord can come to us and say, all right, you see that sin? I want to deal with that. You've got that issue. I've saved you from it. You're, you're no longer under bondage to it. How about we deal with it? And what do we sometimes do? We sometimes say, maybe later oh, or not right now. Maybe tomorrow, not yet, Lord. Let's let, let's let that hang on a little bit longer. And there's a multitude of reasons why we do that. And the number one is because as people, we have a flesh nature that likes our sin. We have a flesh nature that enjoys sin because let's be real, sin for a season is pleasurable. Sin for a season, it feels good. It looks good on us. It makes us look good. So we think. And so when Jesus says, hey, let's deal with that, sometimes our flesh says, ah, okay, but just let's do that tomorrow. Let's do that another time, Lord, when in reality, what we need to do is say, okay, <laughs> let's get rid of that. As the Lord would come to us and seek to say, hey, this isn't compatible with the relationship with me. This isn't compatible with the mission that I'm calling you on. We should say, okay, Lord, how do you want to deal with it? How do you want to get this out of here? I would love to see it go. Or as we identify it, go to the Lord and say, remove this. Hey, let's, let's deal with this sin right now. My friends, so often we can be like Pharaoh, who when the Lord points things out, we can say, yeah, I see it, but let's take care of it tomorrow. When really what we need to do is realize that Jesus, he offers us freedom today. He offers us freedom from sin and freedom and walking out of bondage that he saved us to, into freedom so that we can deal with sin. And he wants to help us deal with sin in the moment that he shows it to us. And as I said, Pharaoh here, he hardens his heart. And though he said he would let the people go, he of course does not. And so what does that bring? That brings another opportunity for another plague. And that's what we see as we pick back up in the text, as we have the third plague to hit Egypt, that of lice. And we see this here in verse 16. Let's read together. Where it says, So the Lord then said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land, so that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth, and it became lice on man and beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now the magicians, they so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice on man and beast. And then the magicians, they said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. So the frogs, they go back to the Nile, they die in big heaps, they clean that up or whatever you want to, however they deal with that. And then again, Pharaoh has hardened his heart. And so this gives another opportunity for the Lord to show his strength. And then what we have here is Aaron, as he strikes the sand, lice come upon the land of Egypt. And what is attacked here, the false deity that is attacked here is the deity known as Geb, who is the God of the earth and of literally the sand. And we have to understand that he's the one who's there on the ground underneath Newt, the girl with the, with the stars, and we'll talk about her in, in just a moment. But this guy, Geb, he is the, he's the false deity of Egypt, the god of the earth, the terrain, the sand. And understand that the Egyptians, they despise lies. I don't know anyone who doesn't, but they definitely did not like. They took great lengths and great steps to do away and make sure they didn't have lies in their homes and really in any of the land of Egypt. In fact, it is why many, of, many Egyptians had as little body hair on their body as they possibly could. They didn't want any habitat on themselves for lice to be able to latch on and to live. And especially the priests who needed to be ceremoniously cleansed and their animals that were used for sacrifices within the Egyptian religion, those were kept clean so as to keep lice away because should the priest be you know, infested, should the animals be infested, well, that would leave no room for them to be able to worship, to carry out the worship rituals that they were supposed to. And so especially as the text here you know, speaks of the, of, of the priest, they're seeking to, uh, to replicate this. They realize they can't. They're, they're trying to give an answer to Pharaoh and they realize very quickly 
they don't have it. They realize very quickly they don't have this. And so they go to Pharaoh. And what do they say? They admit it to it. They said, hey, this is, they say, the finger of God. This is something other than what we are used to. This is something that we can't fight against. They go to him and they're like, hey, we're out of our league here as the lice are on the land. However, what we see with Pharaoh is he hardens again. He hardens his hearts and he doesn't listen to the priests and he tells them and he doesn't listen to them about how the Lord is greater. And of course, he doesn't let the people go. And so we have frogs and we have lice. And as we open up in verse 20, we have, we have flies that come in next. Pick it with me there. As it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water. And then say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants, on your people, and into your houses." The houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. And in that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. I am the Lord in the midst of the land and I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign shall be. And the Lord did so. Thick swarms of flies came into the house of Pharaoh, into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted because of the swarms of flies. And then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron, and he said, Go, sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, It is not right to do so, for we would be sacrificing the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. If we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, then, they will, then will they not stone us? We will, we will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he, command, as he will command us. And so Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away, so intercede for me. So then Moses said, Indeed, I'm going out from you. I will entreat the Lord and that the swarms of flies may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. But let Pharaoh not deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and treated the Lord, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses. He removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people. Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, and neither would he let the people go. So we've had frogs, we've had, we've had lice, now we have flies. It would have been a good time to have the frogs around, but, you know, they were already gone away. And understand the false god that is attacked here of the Egyptians is the, is the god Uchit or, or Wachit, and it's the goddess of the Nile Delta, also of the afterlife, and, and possibly the flies. Some translate the flies and, and speculate that they could have also been, because it deals with the afterlife, they could have also been the scarab beetles that are very uh, often, often... Uh, you know, coincide with Egyptian uh, mythology and things like that, because the Egyptians saw the scarab beetles as, as a symbol of the afterlife. And so here, as the Lord sends the flies, he is essentially, you know, uh, poking fun at their, at their belief system when it comes to um, these flies, these beetles. And this is the first plague you notice that God makes a divide between the Egyptians and the Hebrews. Up until this point, it is inferred within the text that the Egyptians and the Hebrews both had to endure these plagues. And that does cause some problems with some people. Some wonder, well, why would the Lord do that? Why would the Lord have his people who are enslaved in this land, why would they have to endure this? And quite frankly, I don't have an answer for you. And I don't know of any Bible teacher that does or Bible scholar that does. It's just what we see within the text. And that is what we see. And we see the reaction of Pharaoh. He hardens his heart, but he also this time, notice he offers Moses some, some solutions. He offers there to Moses first that they would sacrifice in the land. He says, okay, look, if you're wanting to worship the Lord, you want to have some freedom in that, then hey, you know what? Sacrifice to the Lord here in this land, to which Moses, of course, is like, well, no, that's not going to work out. Should we do that in this land? That would be an abomination to our worshiping the Lord as well as to your people. In fact, that would put us in danger. He says, if we were to sacrifice in this land, we would be an abomination to the Egyptians and they would stone us. And so Pharaoh offers another option. He says, that's fine. You can go out from here, but just don't go very far. You can go out from here, but just don't go very far. And, and the, this response, this back and forth here of Pharaoh and Moses, this response that they have is something to note as followers of Christ. 
Because understand what Pharaoh is doing here and something he's going to do, in fact, two more times as we read in this text, is he's offering compromises there to Moses, where he offers to let the people go. He says, okay, I don't want any more of this. You want to go, so I'm going to let you go. However, there's some conditions for Moses to follow. And in fact, if you're taking notes to just kind of lump them all into one, we see here, of course, in Exodus 8, 28, that the people, he says, they can go, they just can't go very far away. Again, you can go into the wilderness, you can go and worship as you want, but stay close, Moses, don't go too far so I don't have to chase you down. The next place we see this is in Exodus chapter 10, verses 10 through 11. We're going to get to that in just a moment, where he says that, okay, you can go, but only, only the men can go. Only the men can go. You have to leave your wives. You have to leave your families here in Egypt. Again, this is a compromise that he offers. And then a little bit later in that chapter in Exodus 10, 24, he says, okay, the families can go. Men can go. You can go as far as you want. That's fine. Go worship the Lord. However, he says, you have to leave your livestock. You have to leave the livestock, which of course would be a a pretty big issue considering they're trying to go into the land to worship the Lord by sacrificing to the Lord. They would have to come back to get their their tools for worshiping. And each time, as Pharaoh who offers this compromise, Moses responds, notice, with, with a couple things. Notice the first thing that he responds with is unwavering confidence. Unwavering confidence, again, as we mentioned last week, Moses has been uh, pretty, pretty argumentative. He's been afraid pretty much all the way up until his last pep talk with the Lord back last week as we were studying before his interaction with Pharaoh. Whereas he was doubting his own ability to speak. He was doubting even the word of the Lord that said that everything was going to work out as the Lord said it would. He's been fearful. However, again, we mentioned last week that in the second and the third and through all subsequent interactions with Pharaoh, Moses is going to be bold all the way up until the bank of the Red Sea. Like he's going to show this unwavering confidence in the Lord as he stands before Pharaoh. And this is, this is a great example of that. Whereas Pharaoh here offers a compromise, he says, no way, we're not taking that. We want it all or we want nothing. He offers unwavering confidence in the Lord. And we see here that he does so because what he knows is he knows the mission that God has called him to, and that God has called him to liberate his people and to take his people out of Egypt completely, fully out of Egypt, not just some of them, not just, you know, them and leaving their livestock so they have to be dependent upon them, not just going a little bit of the way, but going all the way. Moses knows what the mission is, and he knows that compromise is not an option. He knows that compromise is not an option. He will not only go part of the way in the mission of God. And that, like I said, is something for us as followers of Christ to really take note of and to take to heart tonight. Because in the same way in our own walk with the Lord, seeking to live holy as the Lord is holy, to live distinct, to live a life that is identified with Jesus out of the bondage of sin and walking in the new life that Jesus has given us, Understand that every step of the way in our mission and walking with the Lord, there are compromises that are offered to us. I mean, you just take this list of compromises here, and they can fit so well into what is offered to the believer. I mean, just think about it. Our our enemy, Satan, who the Bible says is against us, he is in no way a friend to the world or a friend to us. He is against everything. And as we seek to walk with the Lord, as we seek to set out, perhaps as you were a new believer, you remember Man, you're excited because now you're going to heaven. Praise the Lord for that. And you have a new life. But you remember perhaps the voice in your head or the voice from someone that Satan uses who seeks to say, oh, okay. Oh, I see you're a Christian now. Okay, well, that's, that's cool. Just, just, just don't get too serious about it. Now, church on Sunday, I, I understand that. Church on Wednesday, okay, that's cool. But a, a Bible study on Tuesday? A men's work day at the church, a mission trip, that's getting a, that's getting a little bit too involved. And that can be something that we hear, that we get from the enemy, from our flesh, from those that we wouldn't even expect. Hey, that's cool that you've got this Jesus gig. Just don't go too far with it. Or perhaps you get past that. You're like, no, no, I'm going all in. I'm I'm going to every service. The doors are open. I'm going to be there. The mission trips, the Bible studies, how I can grow, man, I'm going to do it. 
But perhaps that same voice comes around and says, that's fine. Just don't, just don't drag anyone with you. Like, you've got your friends at church, that's fine, but, but don't drag anyone from work. You don't need to take those people from work with you. You don't need to take your family with you. You need to just leave them, let them, you do you, let them do them, and just kind of, you know, just, just, let, just, let it, just let it be your thing. And another one, one that is really prevalent, of course, is the same one that Pharaoh offered there to them. He said, yeah, you can go, but you need to leave your livestock, And in the same way, we can be walking with the Lord, seeking to start out, walking on mission, serving the Lord, seeking to live a life that is for him, not for the flesh, no longer for the world. And man, our flesh can say, yeah, but you remember that one website? We should keep that in mind. Yeah, you remember that one group of friends? Don't don't delete those numbers. That one guy that you know you can get that fix from, don't don't delete that. That gal that you know will give you attention or or that one dream, that one idea. Yeah, let's not forget those things. Leave those in, you know, leave, leave those in the bank. Leave those for another time. In the same way that Pharaoh knew that if the people had to, were to go out without their livestock, they'd have to come back and then he would have them. So too does Satan, so too does our flesh do that same thing. Where it's like, yeah, you can follow the Lord, but let's not forget where you came from. That's a lot of fun, isn't it? Leave that there for you. We'll, we'll hold on to it. And the compromises will be offered much in the same way. And this is just scratching the surface of what our flesh will desire, what the world will offer us and what Satan will seek to tempt us with. But understand that as we seek to follow the Lord, as he saves us and wants to lead us in a life of identifying with him and becoming a new man, a new woman in him and walking out of darkness and into the light, these compromises, they will come. They will be offered. And our job is to say, no way, no way. I know what I've been saved out of. I know what the Lord has for me now. I see within his word, what is the standard and anything else, that's a waste of my time. Anything else, what it's gonna do, it's gonna stop the mission of God, the work of God in and through my life. And I don't want that. That should be the heart of every single believer. Because as a believer, we are called to the mission of God, to walk his way and to do what he has called us to. And to not take shortcuts, to not allow compromise into our life. You know, Moses is a great example, but another great example, the best example for everything, of course, is Jesus. You know, I think of Jesus. We just read it in the one-year Bible. If you're reading that with us, we just read this, that as he was baptized, you'll remember there in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, it says immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And as he was in the wilderness, he fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. And it says there the greatest understatement in all of the Bible, and he was hungry. Duh, of course he was hungry. But as he was hungry and as he was weak, it says that Satan came. And what did he do? He tempted him. He tempted him there. He said first, hey, I know you're hungry, buddy. You see these stones? You're the son of God. You can turn these into bread. Have at it. And of course, we know Jesus. He answers with the word of God. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He's like, no way. He's not going to shortcut and, 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 you know, shortcut the work that the father wanted to do within him, the work that he was there to do. He wasn't going to have that. He wasn't going to compromise. And so Satan says, okay, well, that's not going to work. But how about this? How about we go up to the pinnacle of the temple? Let's go up there. So he takes him up there and he says, hey, show everyone who you are. Cast yourself off of here because your heavenly father, he won't let you dash your your feet on the rock. He won't let you fall and die. And what did Jesus say? He says, no, 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 we will not test the Lord your God. That's not what we're supposed to do. I'm not for that. And so what do we see? We see the ultimate offering of Satan and really the ultimate compromise and shortcut is he takes him to a high mountain, shows him the kingdoms of the world. And he says, all this I'll give to you. You can have it and understand Understand, some people don't think this way. They don't, they, don't, they don't remember this or like to think this way, but Satan in every single way had the authority to give that to him because this world is ruled by Satan at this time. It absolutely is. The Lord is over all, but because of the fallenness of this world, Satan has every authority to say, here you go to whoever he wants. And in that moment, should, should Jesus had said, okay, let's do this. And all he had to do was bow the knee to Satan. Well, that could have skipped the cross. That could have skipped the pain and the separation. It was a shortcut and a compromise in the mission that God had sent Jesus to do. But thankfully, we know that he didn't, of course. He answers back. He's like, oh, no, no, no way. He says, get away from me. He says, you shall worship the Lord your God. And and that is it. And he shows us here in that example, this, this, this refusing of compromise, this refusing of a shortcut and sticking with the plan and the mission that God, that he, that he was, that he was set on to walk in this world and to live 
as the Savior, to go and live a perfect life, and then to die, and yes, to suffer, but to ultimately provide that way of salvation. Should he have shortchanged, should he have compromised, that wouldn't have been available. And I'm thankful for the example here that we see in Moses. I'm thankful, of course, for the example of Jesus, but I want to not only appreciate the example, I want to live it. I want to live and be an example of not compromising when my flesh, when this world, and when Satan wants to tempt me and lead me in a way, but I want to stick with the Lord. And as he's calling me to live his way, I, I want to do that. And I love that Moses here, he stands before Pharaoh and he's going to do it here and he's going to do it the other two times and say, no, 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 that's not what we're here to do. I'm not here to negotiate. I'm here to walk out what God has. And we see as a result, of course, as Moses, he leaves, Pharaoh's heart again is hardened. And the Lord calls him again to go back in a little bit later with the fifth plague. And as we open up in chapter 9, that's exactly what we see. So let's open up in chapter 9 now and move into this next plague, that of the livestock being killed. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and tell him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the field, on the horses and the donkeys, on the camels and on the oxen, on the sheep, in a very severe pestilence. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. And then the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land." So the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt, they died. But the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. So then Pharaoh sent, and indeed, not even one of the livestock of the Israelites was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh again became hard, and he did not let the people go. The false deity that is attacked here in the, in the dying of the livestock is the god Hathor, who was thought to be this mother goddess and often appeared in the form of a cow. Much in the same way that the Egyptians worshipped and appreciated frogs, so too did they hold cows and cattle in high regard. They held them in high regard, worshipped the animals, and God told Moses, hey, go in, tell Pharaoh that at appointed time tomorrow, all of, these, all of the livestock, they're just going to die. They're going to drop dead. I'm going to make a differentiation between the Egyptians and the Hebrews, and you can bank on it, Pharaoh. That's what's going to happen. And that's exactly what we see happen within the text. We see that there was a division between the Egyptian and the Hebrew cattle, the Hebrew, uh, the, uh, all of the livestock, not just the cattle. And there, as God said, at a, at a set point on that next day, all of the livestock, they died. And of course, what we see is the reaction of Pharaoh is he hardens his heart. It's not hard to see that. The text speaks for itself. So we pick up in verse 8 for the next play. What we see here, it says, So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourselves handfuls of ashes from the furnace, from a furnace, and let Moses scatter it towards the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh. And it will become, he says, fine dust in all the land of Egypt, and it will cause boils to break out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So then they took the ashes from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses scattered them toward heaven. And they caused boils that break out in sores on man and on beast. And the magicians, they could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were, were on the magicians and on all of the Egyptians." But the Lord, he hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Now, with the boils, unlike the other ones, and there is debate amongst scholars on, what, on whether or not this is, but the camp that I sit in, and you can sit in another one, that's fine, that instead of going against a false deity, rather this practice here is attacking the entire religious system of the Egyptians, because understand the priests who would there minister before Pharaoh, they would oftentimes take and perform rituals so as to bless Pharaoh and to bless others. One of those would include taking soot or ash from a kiln, taking it before Pharaoh or before the people, throwing it in the air, and then pronouncing blessing over Egypt, over Pharaoh, over the people and all that were there. And so what we have here is as Moses goes and it is thought from the same kiln or oven, taking the ash or the soot and throwing it there before Pharaoh, well, that was a direct affront of, again, showing that the Egyptians, their superstition was not legit and could not hang with the power of God. 
And we see that, that as Moses does this, he's obedient to go stand before Pharaoh and do this, that great boils come upon the people and the animals. These boils, of course, would be these sores with a, with a hard center that would burst and cause all kinds of pain. And you're so glad you came tonight to hear that disgusting thing and get that image in your head. And as that would happen there, it shows in the text as it hones in on the priest's it shows there that this was a front against their entire religious system and practice as they could not, it says, stand before Moses. As it says that these priests, these magicians, they could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians and on all of the Egyptians. What we have here is the Lord again asserting himself saying, hey, the worship of, of me as the Lord, it is what is true. The worship of the false pantheon of gods that you see within Egypt, that will not stand. In the same way that the priests couldn't, neither could those false gods. And what we have here is a reaction from Pharaoh, is we have his heart again being hardened. But it is this time, it is this time with this sixth plague that we now see the text say very plainly that it is the Lord that hardens the heart of Pharaoh. And I do want to remind, we covered this last week, but I mentioned that we would make, make mention of it again so as to remind ourselves that as the text says that God hardens the heart of Pharaoh, it is absolutely true that that is what happened. And in fact, that's what God told Moses would happen as Moses is on his way to Egypt. He says, look, you're going to go to, you're going to, go to Pharaoh. You're going to tell him that, hey, Israel is my firstborn. And if you don't release them, I'm going to kill your firstborn. What's exactly going to happen? We see in the text next week. But he says there that he will harden the heart of Pharaoh. Exactly what we're seeing here tonight, right in this moment, we see here, and from here on out, it will be God that hardens the heart of Pharaoh, not Pharaoh hardening his own. But I want to remind you that this is not this picture of God sitting up in heaven and just playing chess against himself, and Pharaoh is just this unlucky pawn that is just a glutton for punishment, but rather, this is God this is God confirming, not condoning, but confirming, giving Pharaoh over to decisions that he has already made. Whereas Pharaoh, we've seen time and time, all the way up until this one, has hardened his heart against the Lord. What we have at this point is the Lord saying, okay, if that's what you want, then that's what you get. If that's what you desire, then that is what you are going to have. Understand, God does not harden Pharaoh's heart absent of Pharaoh making the choice to harden his heart first. He is merely confirming that as he said that he would. And so I wanted to make sure to clarify that. And in fact, we see the Lord speak to it a bit more as we pick up with this next plague, the seventh plague, that of hail coming from the sky. Pick with me there in verse 13. This is a long section, but it's very good. As it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For at this time I will send my plagues to, you, to your very heart and on your servants and on your people that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Now if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed for this purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. As yet you exalt yourself against my people and that you will not let them go. So behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause very heavy hail to rain down such as has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. Therefore sin now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field for the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home and they shall die. And he who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh, they made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and the livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be hail on all the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven. And the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire darted to the ground. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, so very heavy that there was none, none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt and all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and my people and I are wicked. So entreat the Lord that there may be no more mighty thundering and hail for it is enough. I will let you go and you shall stay no longer. 
So Moses said to him, as soon as I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease and there will be no more hail that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you will not yet fear the Lord God. Now the flax and the barley were struck for the barley was in the head of the flax was in the bud, but the wheat and the spelt were not struck for they are late crops. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread out his hands to the Lord. Then the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain was not poured on the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, hail, and thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more, and he hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard, neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. We have here in this section, again, this seventh plague, that of heavy hail falling from the ground. And since since the last plague did not attack a god, but rather the religious system and the priestly system of Egypt, God makes up for it this time by attacking three different deities within the Egyptian pantheon. He attacks the god Newt, the sky goddess, Seth, the god of wind and storms, and then Isis, the goddess of life, who is depicted often holding the flax. And you have there Newt, she's the one that's over on the, on the big page. You have Isis, Isis up top, and then, of course, you have their set, the god of wind and storms there on the bottom for reference for you as, as we're studying. And God here, what he does is he tells Moses again to rewarn Pharaoh, to rewarn Pharaoh of the continuing of the plagues, and also to let him know that it is his hard heartedness that is bringing this on, that is continuing this on. In fact, he lets him know, he's like, look, it is your hard heartedness that is allowing my glory to be seen here. As you harden and, and dig your heels in the sand, this is what is going to continue to bring these plagues upon the nation of Egypt. And so we see God there speak there uh, of, of, of more power being displayed, but we also see there, this is the first one where people, the people of Egypt are giving a warning as well, the option to go and shield themselves from this plague. We see there that there is an option for, for the servants of Pharaoh, the, the citizens of Egypt, to take their livestock, to take themselves into shelter. And should they do that, they won't die. But should they ignore that, that advice, then they will surely die. And that's exactly what we see happen. That's exactly what we see happen here. And Pharaoh, we see there, he has a moment of repentance and promises to let the people go if the hail would stop. But of course, the repentance is only to escape this immediate issue because once the hail stops, he goes back on his word and he doesn't let them go. And we notice that Moses, as, as Pharaoh repents, or, or at least on the surface level repents, we see that Moses calls him on that. Did you notice? He calls him on that repentance and he says, no, this is not a true change of heart because what you know is that we only attacked these two crops. You actually have the wheat and the spelt that are still to come. You have in your mind provision that is still stored up, which of course the Lord's about to take care of that. But anyways, we see here that he speaks to Pharaoh and he says, look, what you have in your mind is you have an out from the consequence you have an out from this plague thinking that you are going to be fine. And my friends, as Moses there speaks to Pharaoh, so too does the word of God speak to us as well. To where what we need to be mindful of is that though we escape maybe the seen consequence of one sin, that doesn't mean that we have a right or an end to continue on in sin. Because understand that all sin, well, it has consequences. All sin, everything that we would seek to do to please our flesh and to live according to this world, it will all have consequence. Even if we think, okay, well, I got busted for that, but I'm gonna repent and not do that anymore, but I can do this thing and be just fine. Understand the Lord, the Lord has not let that sin go unchecked. The Lord has not let sin, the Lord has not let compromise and giving into the flesh go unnoticed. It doesn't go unnoticed and he doesn't let it go unchecked. Consequences well, they are going to happen. And Moses calling out Pharaoh, well, it gives us an opportunity to reflect on our own hearts and lives and seek to say, am I harboring in my own heart anything where I'm like, okay, well, I can't do that anymore because I got found out or I can't do this anymore because of the consequences are too much, but I've still got this. Understand the Lord, he will not be mocked. The Lord will not be mocked. He is gonna be faithful to, to, to expose sin and be faithful to let consequences come into our life that we would turn to him in true repentance and not continue on in sin. And we see here that after the hail, again, Pharaoh has in his mind, he has, a safe, he has a safety net. He's got these other crops that have not been taken out. The wheat and the spelt, he says, were not struck. 
But yet we see the Lord has an answer for that. Let's pick up there in verse 1 of chapter 10 as we see this eighth plague come upon Egypt, that of locusts. As it says there, now the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart in the, in the hearts of his servants that I may show these signs of mine before him and that you may tell in the hearing of your sons, of your son and of your son's sons the mighty things that I have done in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them that you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron, they came into Pharaoh and said to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me or else if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory and they shall cover the face of the earth so that no one will be able to see the earth. Then they shall eat the residue of what is left, which remains to you from the hail. And they shall eat of every tree which grows, which grows up for you out of the field. They shall fill your houses and the houses of your servants and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither your fathers nor your father's fathers have seen since the day that they were on the earth to this day. And he turned and he went out from Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh's servants said to him, how long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not know that Egypt is destroyed? So Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh and he said to them, go serve the Lord your God. Who are the, who are the ones that are going? And Moses said, we will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters and our flocks and our herds. We will go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. And he said to them, the Lord had better be with you when I let you and your little ones go. Beware, for evil is ahead of you. Not so. Go now, you who are men, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desired. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. But then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, all the hail that has left, all, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land of all, all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts, and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously, there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them. For they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened, and they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left, so there remained nothing green on the trees or of the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and entreat the Lord for your, your God that he may take away from me this death only." So he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. The Lord turned a very strong west wind, which took the locust away and blew them into the Red Sea. And there remained not one locust in all the territory of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the children of Israel go. The locusts come upon here is a great plague. And the Egyptian god Min is who was the god of the harvest. Many believe that this plague hit right about the, the harvest time of the wheat and the of the wheat and the spelt when festivals would be planned around this harvest. And so what we have here is this God and his party, if you will, being attacked. And we notice that Moses promises complete destruction of the vegetation. He leaves no room for question. He gives a complete and open warning to Pharaoh. He's like, look, when the locusts come, there's going to be nothing left. All vegetation, all things that are going to sustain life as, as far as that goes, all crops, they are going to be gone. And notice that this time we have the servants of Pharaoh. They ask, they beg him to let the Hebrews go. They're like, we can't stand here any longer. Like, what are you doing? He's like, we cannot stand against this. Let them go. And again, what we have here is Pharaoh offers his second compromising release. He, again, he offers for the people, for the men to go out and sacrifice, but they have to leave the women and the children here and they offer the opportunity to go out. But of course, we see here that Moses resists. And Pharaoh, as he, as he is there, he sees the destruction of the locusts of the land. He again repents on the surface level as he did with the hail. But when the locusts are gone, he again does not keep his word. It's very simple to see there that Pharaoh is continuing to harden and be hardened in his heart. But there's something within this section that's worth noting. Something that God says to Moses that he hasn't said yet but it's something that is very important that God is going to say really throughout all of the Old Testament, as, and especially within the first five books of the Bible as we continue to study. He says something to Moses there in verse 2, as he says, there, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's sons the mighty things I have done in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Again, the plagues that we see within Egypt are not just for Pharaoh. 
It's not just for Pharaoh because he's hard-hearted and his heels are dug in. It's not just for him, but rather, again, it is also for the people of Israel. It is for God's people to see. And not only to see, but to remember and then to share. See, God tells Moses that this is supposed to be something that he doesn't just see and and him himself remember is just this amazing thing as he goes out and leads the millions of people of Israel out into the wilderness. It's not just for him and all of them to see and be like, yeah, that was amazing. You know, sitting around the campfire being like, that was really cool what God did back then. It's not just for them to have amongst themselves, but rather it's for them to share with the generations that were to come. Because as the generations would come, the generations that would go and would eventually take over the promised land there under Joshua's leadership, as we get to the book of Joshua, you know, in a couple years, we'll be able to see that. And as you see throughout all of of the Old Testament, there's a consistent reminiscing, reminding, always going back to the God who brought his people up out of the land of Egypt. There's a consistent reminder always of what God did for his people there in Egypt and how he delivered them. And Moses here is given instruction, hey, all of these things, I'm doing these, not just for Pharaoh, I'm doing these for you to share so that the faithfulness of God now will be seen in the future and remembered in the future. So the faithfulness of God can be counted on and seen throughout all those generations. And I point this out because this is something, friends, that is so good for us to do in our own lives. Because us sitting here tonight, I mean, we have in our own lives testimonies and stories of God's faithfulness. I imagine if we took time tonight, and many of you I've talked to, you have stories of God being faithful in your life that are just amazing. Just so cool to hear what God has done, what he is doing. But these are things that are not just for you. They're not just for you to have and to hold and just to keep to yourself. No, we have experiences with the Lord. He shows his faithfulness time and time again so that we can not only trust him ourselves, but can also encourage others to trust him as well. You know, I'm so thankful for testimonies and stories of friends of mine who have gone in church and, and planted churches or have taken great steps of faith. That really encouraged me when my wife and I struck out to plant churches. It really encouraged me, you know, and it still encourages me now to, to talk about the faithfulness of God with friends of mine who are pastors of churches and just living in this daily life as a Christian. It is so encouraging to me to hear the testimony of God being faithful because it encourages me to know that God is going to always be faithful. He's been faithful before, he'll be faithful again. And if you're a parent in the room, a grandparent in the room, man, this is for us to have, to be able to relay to our children. If you're a friend or a coworker to someone in this room, hey, this is for us to speak to those around us that, hey, God is faithful and you can trust him. Here's how I have learned to trust him. Here's what I have seen him do. And he can do the same thing in your life. My friends, we see Moses here instructed to do that. And we are instructed the same. To not be one who hoards the experiences and the faithfulness of God that we see and have in our own life, but to share them so that others can see and hear them as well. And trust God as well. It's an amazing thing what a testimony does. I love in the book of Acts how you see Paul consistently share his testimony at every opportunity. And his testimony only grows. It's really cool to see that. His testimony, how God meets him and transformed his life and all the things that he did. I love seeing Paul's testimony over the course of Acts just growing. And ours does the same. And that testimony, those experiences we have with God, man, they can encourage people far, far, far beyond what we can imagine. Far beyond what we can even know, I believe, the Lord can use our testimony, our walking with the Lord and sharing that with people to encourage them to walk forward as well. And so Moses is instructed to do that. Of course, he carries out obediently what the Lord tells him to do. And we finish out tonight and finish out this chapter with this ninth plague as we pick up in verse 21 and see darkness come over the land of Egypt. As it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand towards heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all of the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel, they had light in their dwellings. And then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Let your little ones also go with you. But Moses said, You must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God. 
and even we do not know with which we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's hearts, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me, take heed to yourself and see my face no more. For in the day you see my face, you shall die. So Moses said, you have spoken well, I will never see your face again. The false deity that is attacked here in this last plague we're going to cover tonight is the Egyptian deity, the god Ra, the sun god, which is revered as the highest of all the Egyptian deities. The Egyptians worshipped the sun. They believed that Ra was the, the, the top of the the top of the, of, the, of the food chain, if you will, there with the, with the false gods. And this darkness that comes over the land of Egypt was a direct confront, confrontation of that false god. And it says there that this darkness could be felt. As darkness could be felt and so much so that no one moved around. The Egyptians basically just kind of sat in one place and said they did not rise and not move around. It completely stopped all movement and progress of the Egyptians. It was a debilitating darkness. However, we see yet again that light was present in the land of the Hebrews. And it's here that as Moses comes to Pharaoh, Pharaoh calls him in, that Moses there is offered this third compromise from Pharaoh. That, hey, you can go and you can go worship the Lord. You can take your wife. You can take your kids. Take whoever you want. Just leave your livestock here. Of course, again, Moses, he, 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 he says, no, we're going to... We're going to go, all of us are going to go, or none of us are going to go. There's no partial exodus in his mind. And Pharaoh, what does he do? He tells Moses to leave. He threatens Moses' life should he come back. And Moses says, okay, you, you, won't, you, you, you won't see me again. And Moses leaves Pharaoh sitting in the dark with still one plague left to go, a plague that we will look at again next week as we, uh, we open up in chapter 11. But before we go away tonight, and before we, before we end our time, you know, taking a, a study like this and all these things, you have all these, you know, Egyptian names in your brain now that are going to be there and pop up randomly at some point. You'll never be able to get it out of there. Pictures that are burned into your brains. You're like, what do I do with this? Well, let me tell you what I, I think we should do with this tonight. As we read the Word of God, and I mean, we could just read this and it could be enough. I'm so thankful for that. We have the opportunity, the same way that Pharaoh did, though he hardened his heart and his heart was hard. We have the same opportunity that the people of God there witnessing all this happening. We have the same opportunity, Moses. We have an opportunity tonight to maybe for the first time or perhaps as a reminder, see and remember just how powerful our God is. See just how strong our God is. Understand that as we read this, we see that the Lord is stronger than any world system. Any world system, religious, non-religious, the Lord is stronger than any world system. He is stronger than any false god or religion. There is none, no other god that is true but the Lord's. The Lord is stronger than any stronghold of sin. And sin is a stronghold. There is, there is sin that is represented and sin that has been defeated Represented within this room, God is stronger than our sin, any stronghold of sin that we may find ourselves in at one time or another. God is stronger than any fear and he's stronger than any type of darkness in and of this world. And I, and I say these things and I pray that as I say these things and as we read tonight, that we as the church, and I think we as the church should pray that we would be reminded of this truth and of this story in the same way that Moses was called to remind well, so too should we be reminded of the fact that God is stronger than anything that we can face. Amen. He is stronger than anything that will come into or against our lives. And it does us as the church well to not forget that, nor to take it for granted and to make it very personal. You know, oftentimes, much in the same way that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, can be so simple. Well, so too can the truth of God being strong and God being, you know, sovereign, and God being omnipotent, meaning he is all powerful, and his immutability, meaning that all of his characteristics, they cannot change, they cannot go down. Sometimes that stuff can become so just routine for us, so routine. We know it, yes, we know God is big. We just read Genesis 1-1 a few days ago. Of course, he created the heavens and the earth. I have no problem with him being amazingly strong, with him being powerful. But what we can do is we can take that truth and we can just make it so simple. So simple that it's almost silly to say, yeah, of course we know that is, absolutely. And the danger there is, 
is we forget it and we also don't make it personal. Meaning that we don't take the power of God to defeat sin and apply it to our lives, truly. We find ourselves trapped by some sin, some flesh desire, some temptation, and we just find ourselves condemned by it, convicted by it always, and we see no way out. But what we need to do and remember is that we have the God of the universe in a relationship with us, desiring a relationship with us, desiring to lead us in a relationship who is strong enough to break the bonds of sin in our life, who is strong enough to break the stronghold of sin and temptation, who provides a way out for us when it comes to that. And we sometimes forget that. We don't make it personal. We don't submit to that strength. We see the darkness of this world, darkness that just like in Egypt, I, I, I mean, you can feel it. You can feel the darkness of this world as you go to work, as you go to school, as, as you turn on the news, as you look on the internet. There is darkness that is felt in this world. And sometimes what we do is we forget that God is still stronger than that darkness. Sometimes we forget that God wants to lead us into this world that is dark. And yes, the darkness can be felt, but the light and the strength of the Lord is so much stronger. And as the church, as we read this and read these story, this story, this true story, we also need to, because we sometimes forget that all of the Bible is true. This right here, it happened. It absolutely happened. These, these plagues literally fell upon the land of Egypt. Sometimes what we do is we forget that this story that really happened, this God that we see causing it all to happen, that he's the same God that we serve today. He's the same God that wants to lead us in this dark world and break bonds of sin and, and, and bondage to sin and, and, and shine light into darkness in our own lives and in the lives of those around us. And so as we remember that and make it personal, what that should do for us is it should lead us from times like this where we sit under the teaching of God's word. Myself, as I teach it, I'm listening to it and being encouraged to remember that my God is strong that my God is the God who created everything and who desires a relationship with me and who wants to lead me in his strength and by his spirit in this world, showing the world his strength and his light that he shines and can come up against any sin and stronghold that I may face and all that I need to do and all that we need to do with all of that information, with all of what we see here is just surrender. It's just trust in that and surrender and say, God, you're it. You are strong. You are big. You are mighty. You are powerful. You want to deal with my heart that is wicked. You want to deal with my sin that's not compatible with a relationship with you. You want to use me to show that to the world around me. And all I need to do is say yes. All I need to do is not let my heart be hard, not let my flesh say, I want this and I want to elevate me. I just say, Lord, you're it. You're it and nothing else. Lead me and let's go no compromise, no capitulation, no deviating from the truth like so many, even within the church are doing today. Sadly, that is the case. But just saying, Lord, I wanna go with you the way that you have, knowing that you are strong and knowing that you're the same God that did all of this that I read about. You're the same God today as you were then. And my friends, I pray tonight that for all of us here, and that we as the church would not only pray and make this personal for us, but we would pray that the church globally would make this the truth of their life and would live this truth out. That we tonight would surrender to the truth of who God is and surrender personally to what he wants to do in our lives. And then also live like we did that. Live like we are surrendered to him. Live like we want the God of the universe to drive our lives and to shine through us in this world. Because as we do so, as we do so, friends, the church around us, those that maybe aren't here tonight, those that see us on Sundays only, maybe they too will be like, you know what? Yeah, you're right. God loves me. God is big. God is strong. I watched the Exodus study online and I want to believe that too. And then as we go out into the world, this mission field that we have is surrendered, trusting in the Lord, Christians. Man, we get to see the world around us change. And I fully believe that as we are living the way God is calling us to, surrendering to him and trusting in the same power that we see within the scriptures, but the world around us will look different too. And it may not be this massive explosion, this massive revival that we want to see where this droves of people at your workplace are saved or droves of people at your school just come to know the Lord. But it could be that one coworker or, or, or that one family member who says, you know what? 
I want to trust that same God that you're following. I want to live in the same way that you're living, going for it, trusting in him. Even this world is upside down and messy in every single way. I want to follow that God because he, he is powerful. He is strong. He is the real God. And it takes us, friends, realizing that, reminding ourselves of it, and then surrendering to that tonight because God is giving us tonight to surrender to the Lord afresh, but also to tomorrow and the next day and any day that the Lord gives us, saying yes to Him, acknowledging who He is and trusting in how He wants to lead us. Next week, we're going to see Moses continue to give us an example of obedience. We're going to see the Lord continue to be powerful. But tonight, friends, as we end out, Remember that our God is strong. He is big. Same God that we see here in the book of Exodus, the same God we serve today. And he calls us to himself to be led by him. And all we need to do is surrender and follow him as he leads.